own model. So you can add banks if you want. You can add inventories. You can add, let's say, a government or public sector. You can also add financial markets and study the impact of speculation. You can also uh, disaggregate the sector of households and try to study the impact of inequalities of income or capital. You can also disentangle the various um, you know, aspects of commodities, consumption commodities and capitals in order to have a multi-sectoral model where you would have, let's say, a sector for agriculture, a sector for energy, raw materials, etc. You can also add a climate feedback backloop. You can also consider an open economy where you would take into account the uh, importations, imports and exports, etc. Uh, so what I suggest to do is to briefly remind you how the, the basic key model works and then to describe some of these applications, namely uh, the Goodwin key model with prices and with the climate feedback backloop. And then I will make a few suggestions in the direction of embedding all this into or within a thermodynamic, uh, thermodynamic model. Okay, does this make sense to everybody? No answer, so I guess yes. Okay, good. So the starting point, the intuition, is that private debt matters. I, I, I stress this point because you would hardly find it in a standard neoclassical economic model. So let me just provide you with a, a number of empirical facts. Here you have the, the blue curve for the US from 1990 up to today. The blue curve is the describes the evolution of the ratio between private debt and GDP. So when, it, in, when it, it increases, it means that private debt is increasing faster than GDP. And um, the red curve is unemployment. And as you see, there is a strong negative correlation between the two, which is easy to understand. If you have an increase of private debt, it means that um, entrepreneurs are borrowing money in order to finance investment. If they invest more, it will probably mean that they are going to hire more people and therefore that unemployment is going to decrease. Okay? Then, once you have understood this, you understand that you need, for any macroeconomic analysis, you need to take into account private debt. And this turns out to be crucial because if you look now at this figure, uh, this holds for the UK between 1880 and today, where you have essentially the private debt to GDP ratio. So when, what you can see is that there is a striking empirical fact, which is the fact that between the end of the 19th century up to 1980, so essentially up to the, the power taking of Margaret Thatcher, then it turns out that the, the private debt ratio, that is the ratio between private debt and GDP, remained constant. If you just forget the two uh, world wars, then you can observe that it's approximately constant around something like uh, six, 50, 55 and 60%. Okay? And then, since 1980, it's increasing like crazy, uh, which is a very bad news because it means that private debts are increasing faster than GDP on the long run. And what it means is that um, a number of entrepreneurs and private companies are borrowing money but they don't create the corresponding amount of added values linked to the amount of money they have borrowed. That is, the banking sector is creating money, but this money is not put into practice in clever investments so that it would create uh, more GDP. Okay? So in a sense, what we could say is that up to 1980, uh, the UK ha had a, a somewhat reasonable growth path where the private debt output ratio remained constant, but then since the 80s, this country is unable to, to, to create to fuel growth without increasing much more rapidly um, private debt. Now, if you look at the US, you will see that actually the US never succeeded in getting some reasonable growth path because it always had some growth at the cost of a private debt that increased more rapidly than output than GDP. You have a question? Yes. yes. Um, take the mic um, to ask the question and speak loud. Hi, Gail. Frédéric Rivers, just yeah. a very short question. 
how can yes. we compare the GDP, which is an annual uh, value, with uh, debt which, which is cumulated? Just imagine that the GDP is enter entirely devoted to making new infrastructure. Then it would be normal to have an increasing debt, right? So maybe yes. I... Just for cl clarification, thanks. Yeah, sure, sure. But what you see is that here, uh, you see that the, the ratio is not one to one. It's uh, something like 55%. So when it's increasing, it means that there is a flow of debt which is increasing and the flow of GDP is not increasing at the same pace. That's the main point. Now, I don't care whether you use the, 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 the increased amount of money to finance new infrastructures or whatever. This should have you know, some impact on the GDP. If it does not, it means that this money has been created without creating added value. And that's the main point which is exactly what we observed, let's say, in Ireland or in Andalusia, in Spain, just before the, 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 the burst of the, uh, the bubble of the subprime crisis. Uh, next, Does question. Make sense? next question, uh, Gael. Um, I am surprised you don't take into account the ratio um, wealth to debt. If a company ratio. increases debt, but it increases in the same time, it's capital, it's not a problem. So regarding oh. only, yes, or regarding only the, the passive and not the active, I think it's not complete view uh, of the I situation. I see what you mean, but the point is that even if you just use this money in order to increase your capital, you should see it on, in the GDP. Because in order to produce capital, you need people to produce, to produce this capital. And these people are paid and uh, this increases GDP. Thank you, Gail. So you can. It does not increase. Oh, uh, it means that you hardly can increase your capital. You see what I mean? Unless you just have, as I said, you know, you have a bubble, let's say a housing bubble or a financial bubble. It means that you are not creating any added value. You are just uh, speculating on some capital which is already which is already existing, and that's the main point. So yes, Roland Sabot from CA. Kadarash to clarify uh, where so people are borrowing, so they are doing something with their with them the money they are borrowing for the bank. So where it yep. goes, it goes to uh, assess increase assess bubbles, or it goes to buy something outside of the UK. Where where does the money went? Well, I mean, this depends entirely on the the use of this money. But normally, this money should fuel some investment that should increase employment and increase GDP. If it does not, then there is a question mark on the use of this money. And the same question, actually, but specifically, how much of that um, might have gone into speculation, uh, particularly in the uh, finance how, sector itself? How, that money? Sorry, I did not get it. Is there a, where you don't see uh, GDP growth, sorry, yes. uh, is there a corresponding correlation with increasing speculation on the part of the finance sector? Yes, you have the data, UK, right? that's clear. And yeah. for a, a country like Spain, between, let's say, 2001 and 2008, it was a housing bubble, especially in Andalusia. I think you then can... Should, then in order to understand what's going on, we should, you know, have a focus on each country, on the specificity <coughs> of each country, and, and try to understand where the, 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 the money is disappearing. I think you can go okay. on, Gail. There are no more questions for the moment. Okay. okay. So, then the <laughs> so the main the main idea between the, the Keen model is to take into account the impact of private debt on, on growth. So let me just, since time is running, let me just uh, jump immediately to the model. It's very simple. So it's a, a toy model. Uh, here you have capital L, which is the employment force, capital N, which is people uh, that could work. So lambda is the employment rate, okay? Then you would just assume for simplicity that the population is growing uh, exponentially, and then assume that you have labor productivity which is also ex uh, increasing exponentially. Um, you, you, you have to consider omega, which is the ratio between the wage bill, so the total amount of wages paid during one year, and, and the GDP. And as you know, this ratio during the, the 30 glorious years was approximately constant, around 60%, and now is declining. Okay? 
Then you add to this the standard accounting uh, accumulation equation for capital, namely the increase of the change of capital is just the difference between investment and the depreciation of capital. And you assume just for simplicity that the production is um, depends upon a production function, which is a Leontief production function, meaning that you have no substitutability between capital and labor. So the output Y is just the minimum between uh, a linear function of capital on the one hand, capital K, and uh, and labor L. Okay. So all this is more or less standard. The the new idea of Steve Keen is just to add private debt by saying that if the amount of investment, capital I, is bigger than your profit, capital Pi, then this must be financed through some debt. So you add this new equation, the chain of debt, uh, uh, dot of D, is just the difference between investment and, and profit. Okay, And then you consider the uh, small Pi, which is the profit ratio. Then it turns out that if you, if to this very simple toy model, you add the short-term Phillips curve, which is an animal which is well known from for macroeconomists, which links the employment rate lambda with the growth rate of wages, okay. And on the other hand, you add also the idea that you have investment capital I, which is just a function of the profit share. That is, the more profit you have, the more investment you are going to put into practice. Then you end up with a very small, nonlinear, three-dimensional dynamical system. Okay, so that's the main idea of this kind of model. That is, you make a few assumptions which are more or less trivial, and then you end up with a nonlinear dynamical system, which you can of course simulate, but you can also study mathematically speaking. And it turns out that in most of these models, you have two kind of equilibria, that is, long-run steady states like in any dynamical system, you have one good equilibrium, which is locally stable, where you have a positive employment rate and wage share and a finite level of debt, and the growth rate is exactly the one that you would find in a standard Soto or Harold Thomas model, macroeconomic model. But at the same time, you also usually have a bad equilibrium, which is also locally stable, where the employment rate and the wage share are converging to zero, so they are collapsing. The, the, the ratio of private debt over GDP is exploding to infinity, and this leads to an economic collapse. Okay? Then the main question becomes, in which basin of attraction of which equilibrium are we now evolving, and is it possible to drive the economy from the basin of attraction of a bad equilibrium, if it's there, towards the basin of attraction of a good equilibrium? Okay, this becomes now a problem of uh, optimal control, of driving an economy within the, the phase space of the dynamical system towards the good equilibrium. Okay, so that's the very intuitive basic idea. What we have done at AFD with my students is the following: we have coupled this with a very simple um, climate backlope where you have to follow this, this uh, curve starting from the, the northeast. Okay, so you have some, suppose you have some increase of the real output. This will increase CO2 emissions. This will increase the CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere, which will, which will in turn increase the relative forcing, which will increase the temperature, which will destroy part of the output. Okay. And then you have a feedback on the global warming on the GDP and capital. Now you try to, to, to simulate the, the evolution of the world economy with taking into account the impact of global warming, and you end up with very interesting, with, with very interesting outcomes. So the big question, of course, is how do you link the global warming, the increase of the temperature, with the, um, the, the GDP loss? Here there is a, a huge debate among macroeconomists. What we have done is that we have used the three main damage functions that are used in the literature, namely the, the damage function uh, used by B. Nordhaus, which is the blue one, okay? then the one, the gray one by Weizmann, and the red one by Dietz and Stern, Nick Stern. Okay? So the, the damage function of B. Nordhaus tells you the following. It claims that if you had, at the end of this century, an increase of the average temperature on Earth about by 6 degrees, then you would have a, a loss of the world GDP of only 10%. Okay? 
which of course is entirely unrealistic. But that's what the, the, the damage function of Bill Nordau says. Okay? Then the damage function of Weizmann, the gray one, tells you that with plus six degrees, we would, lose, we would uh, have a loss of 50% of the world GDP. And the Dietz and Stern um, damage function is much more pessimistic since it tells you that you would uh, have a loss of 90%, of course, okay? Then what we have done is that we have used these various damage functions and we have constructed scenarios to see how the world is going to evolve. Here, and that's very important, this is a way to encapsulate the entire model within a balance sheet where you make sure that um, you have a stock flow that is uh, at each point of time the stocks are exactly the outcome of the history of the flows of the dynamics, okay? So uh, I, I'm not going to enter into all the details, but if you have time, you can look on the slide. You will see that you have the households with the column of the households, uh, the balance sheet of the households, that is the banking deposit, uh, the wages, the consumption, the taxes they have to pay, etc. Then the productive sector, that is the firms, then the banks, and here, just for simplicity, there is no public sector. But of course, in another version, we have added the public sector in order to be able to study the impact of uh, public investment and public spending um, on the economy. Then, as I said, you, you just add to this a short-term Phillips curve. Um, you add a dynamics of prices um, that I will detail if you are interested in because time is running. You assume that the population is evolving according to the United Nations median scenario, that is, that we are going to have 9 billion people by 2050 and 11 billion by at the end of this century. And then you run the model. <clears throat> okay. Um, just to give you a flavor of the kind of uh, outcome we can have, the first one is that absent any climate change impact, that is supposed that the... Um, the damage function is entirely flat, then, of course, we have very good news. That is, um, probably the world economy is on the path toward a good equilibrium, a good long-run steady state, uh, where we would have, as you can see um, on the left uh, bottom uh, picture, the real output increasing uh, exponentially. Um, and then, of course, the emissions in CO2 also increasing exponentially. Then, as you can see on the right bottom um, picture, the atmospheric temperature would increase tremendously, but this would have no impact, okay? And then the employment rate uh, left top would remain stable around uh, six, uh, 70%. The wage share would remain also stable around 60%. And the inflation would be, um, now it's very low, as you know, but it would converge to something close to 2%, so that at the end of the day, the central, the European Central Bank could finally achieve its target, okay? Of course, I don't believe at all in this scenario, but this is, let's say, the benchmark, the, the default scenario, in case we, would not, we wouldn't have any climate change impact. Now, if we do have a climate change impact, then it turns out that the temperature increase changes entirely the dynamic picture. So in order to understand this, here you can see on the left the, the, the change on the long-run good equilibrium induced by an increase of temperature. And what you see is that um, global warming is changing the aspect, the features of the good equilibrium in such a way that even if we still converge to the good equilibrium, despite climate change, then this good equilibrium involves a higher debt ratio, a lower wage share, and a lower employment rate. Okay? So global warming per se is increasing debts, reducing the wage share, and increasing unemployment. Okay? Now, this is just provided that global warming does not prevent us from converging towards the good equilibrium, but the bad news is that this is far from being obvious. Here you can see a simulation of the basin of attraction of the good scenario without any climate change impact on the left. And with climate change impact and just the Bill Nordau's damage function on the right. And what you can see is that the basin of attraction reduces tremendously between the two, which, me which means we have much less chance to be already in the basin of attraction of the good equilibrium if there is climate change impact. Even with a very 
unrealistic damage function as the one which has been introduced by Bill Nordhaus. Okay? Um, now, it turns out that um, we may have collapses if we use, let's say, the dietz stern damage function and if we don't do anything. So here you have some simulations of what can happen. So look just for simplicity at the rate curve. So the rate curve is just what would happen if we were to do nothing, just adding some um, carbon tax, but without any public involv involvement. And if we were to take seriously the, um, the Weizmann damage function. So the Weizmann damage function, remember, is the... Intermediary one, intermediary one, the gray one here. Okay, the damage function, the damage function, which tells you that with plus six degrees, you would have a fifty percent loss of the world GDP. Okay, now using this damage function, which seems to be reasonable, at least for a number of, of people, what you can see is that we may have a stagnation at the end of this century, uh, because the growth, the real output is stagnating, and then the real output is uh, is converging to zero. The inflation rate. Uh, becomes negative before the end of this century. The private debt ratio starts exploding uh, after 2017. Uh, emissions per capita then are declining, but not because we are becoming wise, but because of the collapse. Okay, um, and of course the, the the things would be worse if we were to use the the Dietz Stern damage function, which is the more pessimistic one. Now. <clears throat> um, uh, as you know, a number of, of climatologists don't believe today that it's possible still today to uh, to put into practice the Paris Agreement, uh, that is to remain below the two degrees at the end of the century. We reach exactly the same conclusion with this kind of model. Here you can see the, um, the temperature increase at the end of this century as a function of the climate sensitivity, provided we would reach, we would have reached the zero net emission of CO2 either in 2016, two years ago, or this year. And what you can see is that as soon as the climate sensitivity uh, is larger than 3.1, which is its median value today, then we would already be above the two degree line at the end of, of this century, even if we were to reach the zero net emission this year at the world level, which is of course impossible. So we, we confirm the, the conclusion of many um, climatologic models, namely that it's already too late to try to, to achieve the two degree target. But we do also have some optimistic, I mean, positive results, namely uh, if we uh, implement a very sharp carbon tax, then it's possible to have, first of all, to, to circumvent and to avoid the collapse. And second, it's possible to remain as close as possible to the two degree target, namely to remain close to 2.5 or 3 degree at the end of this century. I don't have time to go into all the details. So here you have the different shapes of the carbon taxes that could be put into practice. And these shapes have been used for the report of the Stern Stiglitz Commission, of which I was a member last year, which published its report last year uh, in May uh, 2017 in Berlin. But the main, the main conclusion is the following. If we have a sharp enough um, carbon tax, then it's possible to avoid a collapse and it's possible to remain close to, as I said, 2.5 or, or 3 plus 3 degrees at the end of this century. Um, so let me now just uh, conclude with a few uh, further research and a few words about, about thermodynamics. Uh, further research, what we, have, what we also have done is we have simulated all what I said uh, in a stochastic version of the model where we put some probability low on the variables that are uncertain. First of all, climate sensitivity, as you know, um, climatologists don't exactly know whether it is uh, equal to 1.5 or to 6, with a median value of 3.1, but we know the, the distribution of this, uh, of this parameter. So we have run um, Monte Carlo simulations with the distribution on climate sensitivity, same story with uh, labor productivity and a number of other variables. So here so you have some examples of the kind of simulations you can reach using this methodology where you have the median trajectory, which is the curve, and then above the curve you have a neighborhood, okay, of a shadow neighborhood, which is um, the probability distribution of the curve, okay? 
Then some uh, some supplementary uh, um, area of research. First of all, what we should do, I guess, is to have an endogenous technical progress. There is a huge debate today about secular stagnation. So far, we have assumed that technological progress is exogenous, but of course, we have to make it endogenous. Second, we have assumed that there is no substitution between capital and labor. And of course, we have to relax this, this assumption, which is too strong. So this has been partially done by one of my students, uh, Flora Makizak in a paper that should be published this year. Then the next step would be to decouple demand and supply, and this is a work in progress by the team here at AFD. What we should also do, and this, this I have already done it with uh, Ulysse Loshkin, one of my students, is to try to distinguish between various vintages of capital. I think that this is very crucial, because if we are to put into practice the, um, the energy shift, uh, we cannot dream that from one day to another all the thermic motors of the, the cars in the world will be changed into electric motors. So we will have to survive with a number, let's say something like one billion cars, which, uh, which work with fuel. And uh, so in order to take this into account, we need to have various vintages of capital within our model. The next point is to have an endogenous population uh, when we experiment some, uh, we experience some degrowth of GDP. Um, this is a work in progress that should converge this year, and this has been done by Victor Cour. Um, then the next point also is you have some better estimation of the um, aggregate behavioral functions I just described, namely uh, the, the um, short-term Phillips curve and the investment function. There is no reason for these curves to be uh, linear. There is no reason for the approximation to be Gaussian. So we should have some polynomials and non-Gaussian residuals. Uh, but this has, this has not been done so far. The next point is something that Fatma Rostam, I guess, uh, presented, or of which she presented some uh, elements this morning, namely adding energy, minerals, and other natural resources into the production function. Um, the next point also is to add some expectations, and this has been done by uh, Eduardo Seto. And also something about inequality, and this is a paper I, I, I wrote last year with Matteo Grasselli from the Fields Institute in Toronto, where the main lesson to be drawn is that if you have more inequality in terms of income and capital, then it's much more difficult to reach the good economy. So, an increase of inequality means that probably the economy is following the path towards the bad equilibrium. And then if you give me just one minute, um, a few words about another point on the ag agenda, which I, I think is very important today, is to try to replace the damage function which are used in the literature and which I briefly mentioned, namely the one by Bill Nordhaus, uh, Weizmann and Dietz and Stern, to replace these black boxes by a much more detailed description of the impact of climate change. So here I'm just putting a work that has been done by Carbon 4, Carbon 4, um, on the qualitative impact of um, extreme events linked to uh, uh, global warming. But of course, what we need to do, what we need to have is a quantitative assessment of this impact. And this is a huge work. Um, I do believe that everybody needs to have this work done in the coming years. As you probably know, the insurance companies are working very hard on this topic, uh, but they don't make public their results because of obvious reasons. So I think we, on the academic side, we need to also work on this issue and to have a much more detailed uh, description of the scenarios I just described. And I'm sure that the IPCC would be very interested in this. Uh, another point, and I will stop with this, is to link all this with um, thermodynamics. So I guess that, that Eric Herbert, I don't know whether he is here, that Eric will present part of the work uh, with which I'm associated, which tries to embed the macroeconomic model I just described within a thermodynamic model. Um, a point that Eric is probably not going to describe is the following. Um, I'm just going to show you, and I don't have time to, go to provide the details, to show you this, because I think it's the most interesting. So the, the rough idea is the following. Suppose that you view 
An economy has a, a huge metabolism, a huge disability structure, which is borrowing energy and, and natural resources from, in, from its uh, surroundings, from its uh, natural ecosystems, which metabolizes all this into some work, let's say useful work in the sense of uh, Bob Iris, and which rejects some wastes, okay? Like any metabolism. Then if you, you use some, you know, simple standard entrop um, I mean, uh, thermodynamic um, uh, theory on this, um, and of course here I'm cheating a little bit because it's far from being simple and obvious, um, you could be able, you should be able to show the following, namely that if you uh, denote by capital M the, the, the intensity of the flow at which you are borrowing energy and minerals from the, the surroundings, then uh, the entropy of the economic metabolism, I mean, the, the change in entropy should be given or could be given by this equation, and namely should be a parabola, which means that if you borrow, you extract uh, energy and minerals at a pace uh, larger than a, a maximum amount of capital M, then you can't produce work. And the maximum amount of work, of entropy, that you can produce is somewhere in the, in the middle. And it turns out that the, the difference between the maximum amount of capital M and zero is given, as you can see in the equation, by the difference between uh, mu r and mu w. I don't have time to go into the details, but it, these are two potentials. But the potential of the resources in which you are borrowing energy and minerals and the potential of the waste. And as Eric is going to describe to describe it, I guess, tomorrow or, or Friday, then we can produce a model where we can show that <clears throat> uh, the economic metabolism is reducing the difference between the potential of resources and the potential of waste. And if this difference reduces or even shrinks to zero, then the ability of the economic metabolism to produce work, to produce anything, uh, is going to shrink to zero. And this might be a way to understand the, um, the red queen effect, uh, which, as you, as you know, is a, a metaphoric way to describe the manner in which, by running faster, we are actually changing faster the, the surrounding, the ecological surrounding, and we are destroying faster our economy. So um, I guess this kind of idea should pave the road towards the, um, a, a new understanding of economics as being embedded within thermodynamics. Thank you. So any questions? Yeah. Gilles. Uh, Gilles Ramstein from LSE. Uh, thanks for this talk. It was really, really very interesting. I, I, I just wonder something. I, I, maybe it's a very naive question, but you show a kind of sensitivity experiments and you show a kind of control run that you said you don't believe it, and anyway, nobody believe it. So the sensitivity of your experiments from the control run that you don't believe is a little bit doubtful. So, because for instance, when we do climate model, we get a kind of control run that we validate for present day, and then we make a sensitivity experiment on it, and we see what is the impact of it. But if you make a sensitivity experiment on something that is clearly not realistic, and moreover maybe some processes as a, a public institution which could be important at the international level is just absent, what do you think about the uncertainties of your, of your run? Okay, thank you. It's, it's a very interesting question. Or maybe I, I, I was a little bit misleading. What I wanted to say is the following. Here you have the simulations of the trajectory of the world economy under the assumption that climate change won't have any impact. And what I said is that this is uh, very unrealistic in the sense that we all know that it's global warming already has a huge impact on the economy. So this was the first point where I said I don't, that I don't believe in these kind of trajectories. So I'm much more confident in the trajectories which try to take into account the impact of climate change. But then this leads to the question of, uh, where is it yet, which is the right damage function? 
And as I said, I don't believe in the in the node house damage function, which tells you that with plus six degrees, you have just a, a loss of minus ten percent of the world GDP. Um, but I'm unsure whether the 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 Dietz and Stern damage function is the right one. So you're right in the sense that what we have to do is to test the sensitivity of our models with respect to this kind of with quotation marks details. But but of course you understand that these are not details. And just next point, and and, um, and I should mention that Eduardo Cedo is going to try to do this, that is to test the sensitivity of the of these kind of family of models um, with respect to all these parameters, not just the damage functions, but all the parameters of the of the model. And second, we should try to replace these damage functions, which work today as kind of black boxes, with a much more detailed description of the impact of, of climate change. So this is also what we are going to try to do at EFD. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> trajectory, not, not just at the aggregate level, like this one, okay, or this one, but also uh, uh, around the world for each country, and why not for each city, you see, but this is a huge work, of course, and then, again, we would have to test all this and to, to check the sensitivity of this kind of model with respect to the specification of this new disaggregated uh, damage function. I don't know whether I answered your question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Gail. Here is uh, Gail Kalanek from ADEM. Uh, yes. I wonder how do you uh, modelize the uh, environmental damage, actually, in your kin structures, features? Okay. Yes. This is, uh, this is, so there are various ways to do it. Uh, if you look here at the balance sheet, you can see, look at the, the the column of the productive sector, okay, and and on the transaction uh, piece in the center, and you can look at the line capital depreciation. I don't know whether you see it. I will put. You see it here. Okay. So this day of K is the the, the destruction of capital which is induced by global warming. Okay, so you have capital depreciation. Here you have the standard depreciation factor, like in any accounting framework, and here you have the impact of of global warming on capital. So the first aspect of the damage function is to destroy a part of the capital. The second aspect is to destroy a part of the GDP. Here you can't see it because it's not written here, and I don't think I have written it somewhere in these slides. But you can check on the on the. In the, in the paper, which is now published in Ecological Economics, um, and this is standard, then you assume that here, uh, the increase of the temperature has an impact of the GDP on the GDP. So instead of assuming that the GDP is given by, uh, by this production function, okay, you assume that this is the theoretical GDP that would occur absent any climate change, and then you multiply this by a, a, a factor which depends upon global warming, and which means, it captures the fact that part of the GDP is destroyed by global warming. So it's very simple. It's just at the aggregate level, but this is exactly the way Bill Nordhaus does it in its famous DICE model. It's also the way uh, Weizmann does it, Dietzenstern and all these people. But of course, I should add, I'm not satisfied with this. I mean, I mean, we have done it because it's used in the literature, and this is a way also to compare our model with the, the, the models in the literature. But again, as I said, I definitely believe that we should now go to some disaggregate damage function. So we have time for the last question, if there is one. <laughs> Hello, Gaël, uh, Jean-Marc. Uh, actually, I have three questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, why is your uh, price, uh, your carbon price, uh, decreasing after the initial shock? Uh, 
The second question is, uh, why isn't the productivity of work an endogenous function uh, depending uh, on the amount of capital or on the global warming uh, and in a future version, I suppose, on the available energy and resources? Uh, and the last question that I had uh, was precisely on resources. Uh, I suppose that uh, in a future version, uh, there you will include also something uh, which is associated to the availability of natural capital at large. Which is associated to what, sorry? Natural capital at large. Uh, yeah, sure, I mean, sure, be sure. it fossil fuels or ore, uh, ground or uh, living species, I mean. Okay, so three questions. On the first question, so if you look here at the, uh, the picture uh, on the top in the center, you have the inflation rate, okay? And you can see here that you have uh, negative inflation along the, 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 bad, the bad trajectory, okay? You can see it? Um, and this is due to the fact that the economy now, because of the climate change, is converging towards the bad equilibrium. The bad equilibrium is ex actually a debt deflationary equilibrium, exactly the kind of situation in which uh, the US were trapped during the 30s or Europe, or the situation in which Japan now is trapped since 20 years. That is, you don't have any growth, you have just a growth of unemployment, and you don't have any inflation. And if you don't find a way, uh, like the quantitative easing, uh, non-conventional monetary policy that is put into practice by the central banks, if you don't find a way to fight against deflation, then actually what you see is uh, a decrease, uh, uh, I mean a negative inflation rate, that is a decrease of prices. So here, in these kind of scenarios, what we see is that since we haven't made the assumption that the central banks could let's say, uh, implement some quantitative easing policy, then the world economy is experiencing a deflationary path. So you have, you do, you do see a negative inflation rate. Is that okay? Yes, it's the perfect. Um, the second question was about, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what about productivity? So I entirely agree with you that we should also work on making the productivity rate endogenous. Um, as, you, as you know, this is one of the the, the mysteries of uh, standard macroeconomics, which haven't, which were, were macroeconomists assumed that you have some technological progress, which is just a name in order to hide the fact that they don't understand why there is growth at all. As you know, the solo model just explains 40% of the growth of the US in the 30 glorious years. And then solo, when he discovered this, he just declared were, well, the remaining 60%, let's call them technological progress. But of course, it's just a name. In fact, what is hidden behind this, as we all know, is uh, energy and natural resources. And then I definitely agree with you that we should link technological progress with um, energy and natural resources. But this I haven't done so far. And then, but, but it's to be done for sure. And then the third point, for sure, I agree with you that we should, at a certain point in the future, try to embed all this within um, the ec ecological ecosystems. But my viewpoint is that this is exactly what the, the, the attempt to have a link between uh, macroeconomics and thermodynamics is trying to do. In, in fact, what we, the picture we should have at the end of the day, it seems to me, should be the following, where the economic system in the, in the center is just one disciplinary structure, you have natural resources, energy, everything is fueled by solar energy. And then, as you know, we, we, exude, uh, we exude waste. And then it seems to me this should be one way to try to capture the impact, I mean, the link between ecology and, um, and economics. Thank you, Gail. Just one word.